Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of the Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. As a business and healthcare law firm, details matter. They do. This season's theme is Zoom In. Once we know our big picture vision or strategy, we have to roll up our sleeves to get the work done. With each episode this season, we will have our typical stories and make sure we talk about specific actions to focus on for 2022. You know, Michael, I'm real excited for today's episode. We have a guest joining us who has a really cool background in both on, on cybersecurity, and which means protecting companies from cyber attacks. Brad, I don't know if we've ever had to s- stop an episode this early where you've started with words, terms of art that the world may not know about. You talked about cybersecurity and cyber attacks in the same sentence, and there may be some people that don't know what you're talking about, although with all the news lately, maybe they maybe they do. That's a fair point, um, and I guess hopefully we'll do a better job explaining cybersecurity than some silly attorney. Um, but what I find interesting is most people don't even know that there aren't even a cyber network. So easiest example is if you save your data on a files on an offsite network that has a pool of these configured computer resources, you're using cloud storage. Well, uh, yeah, Brad, I think we'll leave it to the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so, but – you, when, when you started talking about cyber this and cyber that, uh, it did remind me of one of our favorite TV shows that we both are currently watching. Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso, yes. For those not familiar, Ted Lasso is a TV show on Apple TV, and it's about an American college football coach who is hired to coach a professional English soccer or English football team. And uh, it's a it's a feel good show. Yeah, and and I love it, Michael. And um, cue the audience though as to why cyber network talk has made you think of Ted Lasso. Well, there was a recent episode you and I were laughing about. Uh, first of all, I mean, there's tons of great lines that come out of every episode, but one that I thought of when we were prepping uh, for today's show, when you just said uh, you know, cyber again, was a recent. A statement from Coach Beard in an episode, and um, in this episode, he admits that um, he and his girlfriend, Jane, are now sharing an iCloud account as a form of, quote, digital intimacy. Yeah, there's so many funny lines in that story, and, and, and the heart of the show is really helping others succeed. So uh, obviously uh, the passion statement for Berta Dotto is helping others succeed, so maybe that's one of the reasons why you and I relate so much to the show. Um, Ted Lasso has so many funny quotes. Uh, the one I took just to give the heart of it, when Ted Lasso is being asked about the fact that his team's not doing well, he said, for me, success is not about the wins and losses. It's about helping these young fellows be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. Yeah, I mean, I think other than that, there's not much of a commonality. Like Ted Lasso gives you the exact opposite feeling that a cyber attack might give you. Yes. Um, so let's move back to talking about cyber attacks, even though it's much less uh, feel good. Yeah, and let's get some context to our audience who's not familiar with cyber attacks and um, give them a couple of different examples. Michael, can you think of any examples of cyber attacks that you're aware of? Well, again, I'm going to reveal my uh, simplistic knowledge, but I, of course, saw in the news the Colonial Pipeline hack uh, recently. Yeah, and for those who don't remember, uh, that was a hack by the Dark Side Gang, who attacked and targeted the Colonial Pipeline's billing system and their the internal business network. This led to a widespread shortage all across the East Coast that unfortunately led to East Coast residents hoarding gas and actually setting one of the cars on fire because they were putting in plastic bags and bins. Real, real intelligent there. Um, so this this it disrupted so much that they eventually paid 4.4 million in bitcoins to the hackers, the dark side group. Um, although, according to the New York Times, I just read this that um, the U.S. law enforcement was able to recover much of the 4.4 million ransom, but they still haven't really determined who is the dark side gang. So, Michael, are you part of the dark side gang? I'm not, but I was thinking at least that you know toilet paper didn't run out. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. That, that's good. Yeah, and uh, and they did get some of their money back. Yes. Um, and another one that I just read about recently was uh, uh, it happened to the NBA team, the Houston Rockets, where another group 
hacked them and took about 500 gigabytes of confidential data. And as of this moment, when I just I read about it uh, just yesterday, and uh, they 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 are going to threaten the group if they don't give them some. They're going to threaten the rockets if they don't get paid some money and release a whole bunch of information. So far, uh, nothing's been released on that one. Hmm, I hadn't heard about that one. All right, one more. And this one's kind of interesting just because it's, it's cyber. Um, we, there was a, a group that hacked um, a cyber asset company in Japan, which had a cyber exchange called Liquid. And Liquid is the one of the world's largest cyber currency exchange platforms. Now, it's funny. Think about all the cyber attacks and how they get paid with cyber currency. So now Liquid's trying to get other cyber uh, exchanges to help track their stolen cyber exchange money. It's, it gets really complicated. Um, but basically 97 million of cyber currency was stolen off that. As the kids would say, I think that would be very meta. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, we could probably list a ton of stories on these known hacks. But let's bring in our special guest today who uh, can give us a much more – uh, much more expertise on cybersecurity. So today's guest is Gary Salmon, and uh, he's the founder and CEO of Black Talent Security. He has over 30 years of experience in software development and computer IT. He developed one of the very first cloud-based healthcare systems. He's a speaker and writer on cybersecurity threats. He has uh, been in over 30 national publications and news stories, but the one I know Brad likes the best is Gary has over 15 years as an instructor at West Point. Gary, welcome. Hey, thank you very much. Honored to be here. Appreciate that. Yeah, no, we're and and we're excited again that you're here, uh, Gary. And for the audience, for we like to give disclosures when we can. Uh, Gary's company, we liked uh, when we interviewed him and talked to him a lot while back. Now we liked him so much that Bertadotto actually has hired his company to help us with cybersecurity. Um, now, Gary, uh, for our audience, uh, since we keep using this term over and over again, uh, what you know, what is a cyber attack? Sure, I think we can probably break it into a couple different categories. Um, and through some of your examples, I think you basically nailed it. You know, we we see the attacks occurring in probably two primary ways. One is the encryption of all of the business's data, right? So the hackers either electronically break in or they socially engineer, which means trick employees. And then they encrypt all the data on the servers, the workstations, the backups, basically forcing the business to pay an extortion fee known as a ransom payment to get the data back. Um, so that's, that's one issue. Uh, the other issue is the theft of the data. So in about 75% of the cases that we're dealing with right now, the hackers break into these networks. They go undetected in many instances for weeks. They uh, basically exfiltrate, which is a fancy word for steal, and they take all this data and then they encrypt it, right? So the theft of the data uh, and the encryption of the data is now known as a double extortion. So the reason they're really doing this is because they're almost guaranteeing that they're going to get paid. So mm -hmm. if you're, for instance, a healthcare entity and all your patient data is stolen, however, maybe you're lucky enough to have backups. As that healthcare entity, you're going to need to make a decision. Am I going to just restore the backups and not pay the criminals? Or am I going to pay the criminals in order to prevent them from leaking all the information? Right, taking every single patient record, health history forms, uh, images, x-rays, lab reports, um, driver's licenses, insurance cards, communications with other doctors and patients. Uh, can we prevent that uh, from being leaked by paying them? Right. So that's the decision tree that these these uh, these businesses and healthcare entities are making right now. So if you have confidential information, if you're a non healthcare entity, then you may say, look, it's not worth this data being leaked, even though we can restore it from our backups, we'll pay them the $2 million they're asking. All right. So that's, that's the unfortunate event, right? Years ago, we just saw the encryption of the data. Now we're seeing the double encryption. And actually there's something known as a, a, um, a triple extortion, right? I, I misspoke before the, the, the double extortion, the triple extortion, the triple extortion methodology entails the threat actors actually contacting either the patients or partners of these businesses mm. and saying, hey, we encrypted this business's data. We stole their data. If you don't want us to leak information about you or your business, encourage 
that business to pay us. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's where this is going now um, because they'll do anything to get paid. That's the reality of it. It's a business for them. Well, that's both terrifying and fascinating at the same time. Um, so yeah. tell us why you started Black Talon and what it does. So Black Talon is a cybersecurity for, uh, firm that specializes in cyber. I think one of the biggest challenges we see in the healthcare market and the small and medium business market is uh, leaders, right? The doctors, administrators, business owners don't understand that there's a dramatic difference between what cybersecurity firms do and what IT companies do, right? IT companies are not cyber companies um, and, and cyber firms are not IT. We don't do IT work. We just have highly trained and credentialed individuals that spend basically 24 seven understanding how hackers breach these systems, the types of damages they do, and then put proper defenses in place to prevent that from happening. Um, I think the best example that I can come up with, especially in the healthcare field is this. If you go to your internist and the internist listens to your heart and says, hey, listen, uh, I think you have a problem here. You know, uh, we may need to do a bypass on you, but don't worry. I just built a operatory in the office space right next to me. Why don't I just walk you over there right now? We'll lay you down on the table. We'll hook you up to some general anesthesia. I'll crack your chest and we'll, we'll do the bypass right here. And you grab your clothes and run out of the room, right? Because that internist is a generalist and they serve in a very important purpose, right? But they're not a cardiothoracic surgeon. Right? They're not going to do a triple bypass. But the problem we have now is that most business owners say, oh, my IT guy builds computers and he keeps us up and running. So he knows a lot so he can protect me. But it's a totally different set of uh, credentials, uh, training, knowledge, et cetera, just like it is in, in the healthcare space or in the, the tax world. You wouldn't have a, um, your, your bookkeeper prepare complex tax returns. Same exact concept. And so we formed Black Talent to really uh, help uh, small, medium businesses, healthcare entities uh, protect, the, protect their data by, by specializing in this. So we work hand in hand with IT companies all across the country. And we, we add additional layers of security, which we can talk about to help prevent what we just discussed, you know, the theft of data, the encryption of the data. And one of the most important things is the business interruption. Right. Almost anyone that gets hit by a cyber event, uh, ransomware, et cetera, they typically have to close their doors for about two weeks, regardless of how good or how redundant their systems are. That's what happens. Look at even these monster multi-billion dollar companies. Look at CNA insurance. They were closed for weeks. Literally every computer uh, was encrypted with ransomware. What do you do? 18,000 something computers, I think is what the report says. So here's a company with ridiculous amounts of money. Um, it's not like they flipped a switch and magically everything came back on the next day. So, you know, in the healthcare space, we see the exact same thing. Most healthcare entities will close their doors for two weeks, not be able to treat patients, not be able to access their EHR, EMR systems, imaging, lab reports, prescriptions, things like that. So this goes way above and beyond just the, you know, the theft of the data and the encryption. It's you can't treat patients and, and patient care suffers dramatically. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I started this episode with just three examples. You just gave another one, but obviously without really re revealing your actual client, do you have a, a story that you can share with us about how serious is and, and, and the impact it had on that particular client? Yeah, I, I have two really good recent examples. Um, one is a uh, ortho practice uh, in Utah. They were hit about two months ago by Conti Ransomware, which is a very, very active threat group. Um, and basically uh, they, they breached the network electronically. This one was not uh, a targeted attack against an employee or a doctor. They electronically breached the network. Uh, they were on the network for about two weeks before they revealed themselves, meaning they encrypted the computers. But during that two week period of time, they offloaded all of the patient data. Um, they left a, a ransom notes all over the machines, basically kind of like a, you know, a, a warning saying, hey, we've encrypted all of your data. Here's who we are. Here's how you contact us on the dark web. Um, we informed the practice that uh, Conti is notorious for stealing their patient data. And believe it or not, the doctor's like, yeah, I don't know if that's really true. I think that's just an idle threat. I don't think they actually do that. Why would they steal our data? 
So we made contact with the threat actors through the dark web. Um, we asked for proof that they stole the patient data. They sent us a one gigabyte zip file, one gigabyte uh, file of, of patient data. So we opened it in front of the doctors and they flipped out. Right? Yeah. So they saw photos of their patients, you know, obviously, like I described before, lab reports, uh, medical notes, everything, driver's licenses, insurance cards, all of the above. Uh, some of these patients were children, uh, which actually made it worse. And that's when the doctor's like, you know, what, what mom or dad is going to trust me with their patient care now when I have to go and tell them that this happened. Uh, this, this resulted in the practice being down for about 10 days, right? By, because every single machine, every workstation, laptop, tablet, server was fully encrypted with ransomware. And what it made, what made it even worse was they gained access to all their cloud backups. So in this case, the practice originally thought that they were probably going to be in an okay place because they'll restore their data from the cloud, but they conducted surveillance on the network in, in, during that two week uh, window and were able to get the credentials to their cloud backup. Wow. All right. So once again, if you think about it, they don't want to just reveal themselves instantly, right? By hitting them with ransomware, they want to guarantee that they're going to get paid. Uh, this uh, event cost this practice about a quarter of a million dollars of which they did not have insurance. Mm, right? oh. So even if they did have insurance, right? Uh, they still would have been down the same amount of time. It doesn't, that doesn't change anything. Yeah. The, the burden of, of the financial impact would have been mitigated, but yeah, I mean, really, really upsetting situation. And then w what also happens is they have to go through a full forensics investigation to once again, confirm that the data was stolen, even though we knew it was stolen. Right. So the doctors sit and wait for a couple of weeks, you know, for that news, you know, so from, um, you know, from a psychological standpoint, a lot of people don't think about the impact, yeah. right? As a business owner, as a doctor, as a trusted person, right now you got to deal with, hey, what are my patients going to think? What are my staff going to think? Um, the other case that we did uh, just recently was an orthopedic group in, in the Southwest, and they got hit um, by Conti as well. Conti demanded $550,000. Wow. Um, the group because they didn't have insurance. And this happened to be a pretty large group of doctors, 20 doctors in this group. Um, they opted not to pay. And when uh, we went radio silent with a threat group, they immediately started contacting the employees, telling the employees that they stole the HR files. They have their social security numbers, date of birth. They started emailing them, telling them that they should demand that their boss, that's what they called them. You know, we want your boss to pay us. Otherwise, you know, we're going to go after you individually. So it created unbelievable chaos for the doctors and the nurses and the staff within the practice because now it's personal. Mm -hmm. you know, so you know, there's lots of things, unfortunately, people don't think about. They all say, hey, I have this magic backup and I'm going to press the magic pink button and the unicorn's going to appear and we're going to be fine again. And in most cases, that, that just doesn't happen. Wow, that's amazing. So kind of with all that, you know, scariness, um, what are some of the best practices you can offer to our audience to assist, you know, with protecting themselves from a cyber attack? Right. So re really great question. And, and I think the reality is almost every case we've dealt with and we've done with a ton of these ransomware cases is they're preventable, right? Using best practices. So as scary as this is, and as horrible the situation is, most businesses get hit because they don't have what's now required to be in place. So let's go through a couple things that um, you can almost do on your own and then others are gonna take a specialty firm to do. So for email, multi-factor authentication is critical, right? So many practices have email breaches and businesses have email breaches simply because they don't have MFA turned on. If your email platform does not support MFA, you know, it's either called two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, if it doesn't support it, Get a new one. It's that simple. Find a new one. Second, use strong, unique passwords. One of the things that hackers do is they will gain access to these databases that have all of these previous breaches, right? And, and in, these, in these databases, it'll have your username and password, and they will try and reuse your username and password to see if you use the same password on your email accounts, on your bank accounts, right? Things like that. So you should be uh, using strong, unique passwords and strong, I mean, at least 14 characters, upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters like an exclamation point, 
hashtag and make sure every website you go to has a unique password. You can also use a password manager, which we just don't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but look at password managers. They are a, a, a very uh, effective tool. Um, patching, right? Patching of computers is really important. I hear this all the time from businesses. Oh, our IT companies patch our computers all the time. And then we get onto these networks and we're like, oh, you're missing security patches from 2019 and it's almost 2022, right? So, you know, help me understand how you're doing proper patching. Uh, so that's, that's an issue. And then in terms of actual cybersecurity solutions, it all starts with a uh, security risk assessment which is when a cyber firm basically asks your organization, you know, somewhere between 100 and 500 questions, depending on the size and type of organization you are. And what that does is that helps expose where you have risk that you're not even thinking about, right? One of the big issues right now because of COVID is remote employees, right? And everyone's working from home and mm -hmm. their 10 year old kid downloads, you know, a nasty piece of, uh, you know, nasty video game and it's malicious and, it moves from their computer to your work computer, from your work computer, right up to the corporate environment, right? Or right into the practice. Hmm. Disaster, right? So, you know, then discussions about how you back up, um, where you back up. Even nowadays, who has access to your data at those backup companies? And when you ask most business owners, where are your backups actually stored in the cloud? You know what the answer is? Crickets. No one has any idea. No one has any idea, but as the owner, you got to know that, right? That's, that's kind of a must have. So conduct a, uh, a security risk assessment is critical. Um, next, hackers breach networks in one of two ways as we open the conversation with. They, they either trick your employees and the employees give them access or they hack in electronically. So in terms of electronic hacking, uh, the hackers use vulnerabilities to exploit networks. So what they'll do without your permission is they'll scan your firewalls, they'll scan your devices, they'll look for vulnerabilities. And if they find them, there are hacking tools that are designed to specifically exploit those known vulnerabilities, right? So you can gain access to a, a laptop, a workstation, a server, uh, even a device like a smart device hanging on your wall, and then use that as a launching pad to get at other devices. So once they're in your network, they will do what's called a pen test. They will launch tools inside your network to find other devices that can be exploited and ultimately get to the data, right? That's, that's what they do. So through vulnerability management and identifying these risks, you can eliminate those vulnerabilities and really do a great job at hardening your network. So if there are no vulnerabilities, they're gonna then typically rely on your employees. So the way you beat them at that game is through training. Right, cybersecurity awareness training, if you're in healthcare, is required under HIPAA. It's not even an option. It's like OSHA. You can't be like, oh, sorry, my nurse got stuck with a needle. I didn't know I had to train on OSHA. Right? That doesn't work in the legal world. Um, so you have to train your staff on how to identify threats that present through the use of email and the internet. Um, should be ongoing, you know, with constant reminders. Once again, cyber firms typically provide some type of uh, training platform to educate doctors, employees, you know, administrators, things like that, business owners. Um, another thing that's very effective is a penetration test. I sit on a lot of panels with law enforcement and uh, probably the best statement that I ever heard from an FBI agent was either do a pen test yourself or the hackers will do it for you and one's going to cost you a lot more money, right? <laughs> and you know which one that is, right? So uh -huh. if you pull... <laughs> If you pull your firewall logs for your business or, or healthcare org, you'd be horrified. Horrified at how many things the firewall is actually stopping, but at some point they're gonna get through. So a pen test is when ethical hackers working for cyber firms actually try and break into the system with very limited information, basically the same amount of data that a criminal would have. And if they're successful, they'll sit down with the IT resources and help them understand how they're vulnerable and what things need to be put in place to patch those vulnerabilities. The last thing that we're starting to see, which is a very effective tool is um, something called endpoint detection and response, or really the next level up is called extended detection and response. This is a piece of artificial intelligence software that goes on every single computer in your, your business or office. And what it does is it looks for the fingerprints of malicious code looks for hackers staging an attack or actually having access to your network and does a couple things. If it detects malicious code, malicious hacking tools, 
it literally launches a kill against them and destroys them. Mm. Um, if it detects the staging of an attack, because often hackers use similar tools and toolkits, it will isolate the machine. It'll literally shut that machine off from the rest of the internet and alert the cyber firm, hey, we got this going on. Um, and this may be enough to stop a massive attack against the org. So this XDR, extended detection and response, basically allows it to look at all the computers in your environment, mine all of that data, and within fractions of a second, make decisions 100% autonomously. It doesn't rely on notification and some human behind a keyboard making a decision. It just makes the decision right or wrong. In most cases, it's right and does something. Um, so these are the types of things that, that uh, practices and businesses really need to have in place. Vulnerability management, pen testing, security risk assessment, training, this XDR software. Well, Gary, uh, first off, thanks again for, number one, terrifying our audience. So that's great. <laughs> but more importantly, educating them about how, how there are certain things to put in place to protect them. So we want to thank you again for joining us today on the Legal 123s with Berta Dada. But we're going to say goodbye for now. But uh, thanks again for joining us. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, we're going to go to commercial. When we come back, uh, Brad, you and I can have a wrap-up discussion from a legal perspective on uh, all this great cybersecurity talk. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Bird Adato. I'm your host, Brad, with my co-host, Michael Bird. Now, Michael, I'm extremely thankful that Gary could join us and terrify our audience today. Um, but uh, let's kind of jump into the second half, which is the application of the, of the law here. Yeah, no, no doubt. I I have, have the uh, brain exploding emoji going uh, in my head right now. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> uh, so, you know, with this season being Zoom in, um, I think it's time to – you know, focus on taking this seriously, obviously. And um, so, Brad, let's talk about some of the laws that impact medical providers. Yeah, and he, Gary mentioned this. He said the word HIPAA, and again, for those not familiar with it, it's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. just rolls off the tongue. This is a federal law that requires um, the creation of national standards to protect sensitive patient health information, also known as PHI, for being disclosed and basically without the patient's consent or knowledge. Well, you talk about dialing it down real quick, going from the, <laughs> you know, almost uh, hypnotizing talk of these cyber attacks to HIPAA uh, as a uh, slamming on the brakes real fast. But how in the world does HIPAA apply to cybersecurity? Well, I thought you'd never ask, Michael. Um, HIPAA <laughs> has basically two rules that you have to be aware of for our audience. One is the privacy rule and one is the security rule, and I'll keep it real safe and fast. The privacy rule is the safeguards of protecting that protected health information. So how do you? what are the privacy standards? The security rules are, as it sounds, what ways to creating um, and maintaining in, um, when you're when – you're when you're submitting this information in electronic form, which is also known as electronic protected health information. Brad, you're crushing it, man. Thank you, man. All right, last statement on HIPAA. I'm going to move off it real quick. So basically you have to understand is, um, you know, assuming your medical practice, um, that, that HIPAA applies to it, and we could do a whole episode, of that, but that would probably bore everyone to death, and that you have this EPHI, you have to develop safeguards and anticipate these threats to secure this data. And that's why developing a, a HIPAA compliance plan and processes is so important. So we get a lot of pushback on the time, effort, and cost of developing a HIPAA compliance plan. Uh, we've been trying to push that uh, ever since it became a requirement. What, 09? Yeah. Is that? Oh, yeah. my goodness. Um, so what are some of the easy steps a client can take to start this process Um without having to even hire a law firm or a cybersecurity firm. Yeah, I mean the easiest thing you can do is just kind of start – we can call it a risk assessment, but really just start looking around 
and and really start thinking about what are the protective measures that you should start um, to to protect these assets or the the protected health information. And I'll give you two just real simple ones to think about physically. Like where is your data stored? Gary talked about it. Is it stored on a, on a laptop? Is it stored on a flash drive? Is it stored up in the cloud? Where is it? Just where is it physically located? And once you figure out where is it physically located, what tech, uh, technical aspects have you put in place um, to protect it? Are you using some off-the-shelf um, cybersecurity um, to, to have some type of codes? Have you updated your computers lately? Because if you are having protected health information and you are using EPHI, there is a HIPAA-level security auditing that you should be having um, your, your either your, 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 your group that's working with you or a group like Gary to kind of check into it. He talked about two-factor uh, authentications or multi-factor authentications. All these are ways for you just to start thinking about ways to start protecting it. Again, these are two steps, but there are things that you could do without ever having to contact a Gary or a law firm. Yeah, and then on the on you know Gary mentioned the people side. Uh, surprise, surprise that people are a risk. Um, and he kind of the uh, administrative side of assessing your your risk. And this could be as simple as as developing internal policies for your business for cybersecurity protection. And actually implementing the policies and training your employees along the lines of, of what what Gary said. Yeah. All right, Michael. These are all good points, and I know we're going to kind of close off the episode here. But let's hit the pause button again and zoom in and talk about specific actions to focus on on cybersecurity. I think two two things. Number one is you want to look at your insurance situation and make sure you have uh, appropriate coverage for a cyber attack. Totally agree. Um, Cause that's uh, we've had clients whose businesses have been saved because, because they, had they had it. And then, and then secondly, as boring as it sounds and as lo- much as we've been saying it, uh, get, build your HIPAA compliance plan. If you do anything, uh, policy wise in 2022 and you accomplish putting together a HIPAA compliance plan, um, it will go a, a long way both to mitigate risk on a cybersecurity attack and protect you if something happens and you have a breach. And, um, I guess I'll just wrap it all up by going back to our episode of Ted Lasso. And, you know, what we really don't want to happen is for you to have some unwanted digital intimacy with a hacker. Yes, that's for certain. Uh, well, thanks again. Uh, join us next Wednesday when we're, our longtime friend and client, Dr. Grant Stevens, will be joining us to discuss technology in the healthcare industry. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe. Make sure to give us a five-star rating and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadotto newsletter by going to our website at bertadotto.com. Bertadotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.